Tonight's exciting presentation is on exploring the Colum Columbia River Gorge. Ron Blem, our presenter, is new to Minnesota, but spent the last 30 years in the Pacific Northwest, most of those years hiking and exploring in the gorge. Tonight, he will share some of his thoughts, experiences, and lessons from this amazing place. So, Ron, take it away. All right. So, uh, the Columbia River Gorge, this is not my photo, by the way, um, but I just wanted to... Uh, I guess it's an excuse to share some pictures with everybody here at the Rovers uh, about the Columbia River Gorge. Um, we're going to see this building in a number of shots. It's a rather famous landmark on the historic scenic highway that runs in the western half of the gorge. And uh, so we'll see this. I'll have more about that as we go along here. So first of all, just to kind of get everybody oriented to some geography, uh, the Columbia River starts up in British Columbia, flows to the southwest uh, through Washington State, and then it marks the border between Oregon and Washington and flows into the Pacific Ocean. Uh, you may remember, I don't know, uh, 50 years ago, Evil Knievel tried to jump over the Snake River. Uh, the Snake River here in Idaho, Montana also feeds into the Columbia. So that's kind of where we are. And specifically tonight, we're talking about the Columbia River Gorge, uh, which is the western portion of uh, between Oregon and Washington, where the Columbia River flows. I always think uh, of the river and the gorge as being the state line, but really it's only true for about two thirds of Oregon and Washington, not the entire state line. The other feature to be aware of is the Cascade Mountain Range. This is uh, perhaps a unique mountain range to what some of us may think of. Uh, the Cascades is a 700 mile mountain range, starts in Northern California, kind of an extension to the Sierra Nevadas. Um, and runs well up into British Columbia near unto Alaska. Um, there are some uh, landmarks in the Cascades, uh, particularly Mount Shasta at 14,200 feet is in Northern California. Mount Hood is well known to Portlanders. Uh, Mount Rainier in the Seattle area is the tallest peak in the lower 48 at 14.4 and Mount Baker in the far north of Washington state. And there are others that uh, didn't make the list. So uh, when we think of mountain ranges, if anyone's been to the Appalachians or the Himalayas or the Alps, you think of a long continuous mountain range with various peaks. The Cascades isn't really like that. Uh, the Cascades is more uh, low rolling foothills, um, two to 6,000 feet rolling along with some prominent peaks like we just had on the prior list. So this is a view of Mount Rainier again, 14-4 uh, uh, viewed from Seattle Airport. The entire Cascades may be kind of a long building height here. And then we have these periodic mountains that uh, shoot anywhere between uh, eight to 10 to 12,000 feet higher than the surrounding mountains. Um, everyone's probably heard of Mount St. Helens and the famous Pacific Northwest volcanic eruption of May of 1980. Um, interestingly enough, so correct me if I'm wrong, the tallest um, mountain, if we call it in Minnesota is Eagle Mountain, somewhere around, uh, what is that, 1700 feet or something like that. So uh, just for fun, I sketched it in here. Eagle Mountain is how much blew off the top of Mount St. Helens. So for a little perspective, that's how much shorter Mount St. Helens is now. Um, and uh, yeah, so Mount Hood typically is a little more pointy on top. Mount St. Helens and Mount Rainier are both a little more uh, rounded cinder cone kind of look. I wanted to present on the Columbia River. Uh, Rovers has done presentations before like skiing across Sweden or animal tracking in uh, South Africa and things like that. There's a group going to Joshua Tree, which sounds fantastic. Um, 
but I wanted to present on the Columbia River Gorge because it is very accessible and it is relatively closer uh, than South Africa. So anyway, um, so the Columbia River Gorge is where the waterway uh, carved its way through the Cascade Mountains. So this is the view from the Washington side looking east. Um, on the western end of the gorge, you see lots of evergreens here. Lots of uh, fir trees covering the hills. As we move further east, the trees get a little more splotchy and way in the east, it's a little more arid. Well, we'll talk about that. Um, here's this uh, stone structure again, was actually a rest area built in the early 1900s on the original scenic highway, which is uh, being restored. Um, so this is quite the different view to what you get in the eastern part of the gorge. This is the very western end, uh, close to Portland, Oregon. So I think the elevation of Boise is somewhere around 2,000, 2,200 feet. Um, Portland is at 72 feet above sea level. And as the ice age receded and uh, melted, uh, the waters on the east side needed to get to the ocean. And the gorge is the carved out pathway through these Cascade Mountains. Um, and it kind of made a dramatic effect. West of the Cascades, uh, the mountains kind of act as a buffer and tends to be a little more uh, wet and humid and cloudy and rainy and green and mossy. And then the mountains provide a little buffer there and east of the Cascades tends to be a little more arid, a little more, uh, a little more high desert kind of thing, um, but also really good for, uh, grain and uh, food production. So more rainforest in the west, uh, more high desert in the east, uh, but we can get this just within uh, several dozen miles of distance. So it's uh, pretty close at hand. This picture is more on the eastern side. So here we have pine trees versus fir trees. You see a little more scattering of the trees around here, not quite the dense underbrush. And then you can see the clouds stacking up here along the Cascade Mountains where it's probably raining in Portland yet sunny here on this part of the gorge. Just to give you a little perspective, I fired up an old flight simulator game that I have on the computer. So this is uh, eastbound out of Portland International Airport flying along the river. Here's Mount Hood depicted and really what I wanted to show you is these troughs come down here and flow into the Columbia River. And this is where the glacial melt flows down and the rain flows down and dumps into the Columbia River. Uh, this is the view driving on the Oregon side through the early part of the gorge before things get uh, terribly dramatic. Given the prevalence of water, given the topography, given the rich volcanic soil, uh, given the high variability in weather, the gorge really is its own standalone ecological system. And we see things in the gorge that really occur nowhere else on the entire planet. So for outdoor enthusiasts looking for something new that is still accessible, uh, the gorge may be a fantastic option. Y'all have heard of Lewis and Clark before. This is from Clark's diary, October of 1805. We proceeded on river enclosed on each side in high cliffs. As we proceeded on, the mountains grew high on each side containing scattering pine, white oak, and undergrowth. The hills are steep and rocky, showing evidence of rock fall. And I'm thinking, why would you travel in October? It's cold and damp in October. A cloudy, rainy, disagreeable morning. We explore rapids through the Great Chute, is what they were calling it then. Rocks are eight to 10 feet high and portage will be difficult. These eight to 10 foot high rocks have now been covered uh, by the river with hydroelectric and agricultural damming projects. More about that in just a bit. 
Um, for the wine connoisseurs in the room, uh, the Columbia Gorge Wine uh, Vineyards uh, produce a lot of different varying wine tastes and flavors and textures. Um, it has really become quite the booming produce from this area of the, of the globe. A couple of pictures here again of uh, some of the vegetation and some of the growth and some of the vineyards. Uh, there are also uh, Stern Wheeler River Cruises uh, as well as uh, River Cruise uh, where you can get a cabin and lodge overnight and it goes uh, far up the gorge into Washington State and out to the Pacific Ocean. Um, another view here, this is uh, on the Washington side, uh, again on the eastern half of the gorge, more pine trees, more open space, and a little more arid in this particular view. This is looking east towards the gorge. This is Mount Hood on the horizon here, again a little more pointy than we see from Mount St. Helens or Mount Rainier. Uh, again, this is 11,200 feet rising above the five or 6,000 foot Cascade mountain range there. The gorge is going to be on the left side of the picture here. These mountains far on the just the left edge are actually in Washington state and the gorge runs here between Oregon and Washington, running east to west. This photo is actually from my cousin's property. She lives in Washington state, uh, north of Vancouver, Washington. Uh, again, west of the Cascades, more fir trees, more greenery, more undergrowth, uh, and ferns and green and moss. And there's her view of Mount Hood on her property. Quite the scenic area indeed. Uh, outdoor, out door enthusiasts website uh, proclaims less than one hour's drive from Portland International Airport, the Columbia River Gorge is scenic and easily accessible. So it has been marketed as an outdoor lover's paradise. Uh, this photo is actually taken from that stone structure, which was uh, an original rest area on the scenic highway. This is looking east uh, at the west end of the gorge. And these features here with the uh, two to 4,000 foot high hills uh, with the gorge roughly at sea level and the river running through the middle. The first highway was started in 1912. Um, it was called a destination unto itself at that point in time. And uh, much of the original highway was uh, undone or built over when the major interstate was started. And it is now in a restoration project, which has been ongoing for the past 25 years or so. Um, much of the scenic old highway is not drivable, but is open to bicycles and hiking. So if anyone would like a 75 mile bicycle tour down the old historic Columbia River Gorge Highway, totally worth it, absolutely fantastic. Uh, 75 miles between Troutdale and the Dalles, it was the first planned scenic roadway in the United States and it does not disappoint whatsoever. Friends of the Columbia Gorge describes 92 hikes, but uh, we should have a little side note that that's only on the Oregon side, does not include any of the hikes on the Washington side. So again, for the rovers, for outdoor enthusiasts, for people who want something to do, um, there are 92 hikes easily available right there in the gorge. There's also a nice little 75 mile bicycle tour. Um, super scenic and super worthwhile. Um, something that we may not see as much here in the Midwest, uh, heavy mosses and lichens growing on the rocks and the trees. Uh, people always uh, joke, you know, when the Cub Scouts, if you lost in the woods, look for the moss, it's on the north side of the tree. That is not true because uh, in the western part of the Cascades, the entire tree is mossy and uh, you cannot tell north from south or east or west by looking at the trees. 
just 30 miles east of Portland, the Columbia River Gorge offers amazing views, hiking, mountain biking, trails, and more than 90 waterfalls. So depending on how you count here, um, this is my picture from McCord Creek Falls. Uh, this falls here is probably 18 or 20 feet. There's another eight foot falls right here. Continuing down the creek over the edge, there is another 50 foot falls. And then this is the Columbia River down here. So this is a gorge hike up one of these little canyons. There's also upper McCord Creek Falls off the right side of the screen here um, within view of the Columbia River. Beautiful hiking, beautiful scenery, lots to see and do. And the wide range of elevation from roughly sea level to 4,000 feet, as well as varying precipitation. So we're talking less than 10 inches of rain per year in the east and more than 120 inches of rain in some specific gorge canyons. Uh, so it creates its own little micro ecosystem. These isolated microhabitats have allowed for endemic plants and animals to prosper, um, no fewer than 13 wildflowers and literally hundreds of mosses and lichens where they may grow not just in the gorge, but in one specific canyon or in one specific area. You may have uh, certain mosses that grow in one canyon by one particular waterfall and you hike a mile up creek and the elevation has changed and you're not going to see that type of moss again. So some really interesting features and interesting challenges and great scenery. Vistas reminiscent of Norway. We're going to chat about this picture here in just a little bit. It's a picture of my daughter. Um, Clearly it's in the spring because the river's full and the island is mostly underwater. Um, I'll show you where she's standing in this picture. Um, but yeah, high, high overlooking vistas are fantastic. Conversely, there are some areas accessible only by swimming. And this is one of these examples here. I can promise you this wall on the right side year round it doesn't matter the season, this will never see sunlight at all, ever. And in this picture, and this would be uh, early summer, um, this side does get some afternoon sun. So left is east, west is right. We're looking kind of south towards Mount Hood, uh, glacial runoff coming down here. But uh, where you would get some sunlight on the wall, um, versus no sunlight, there will be completely different plants growing there. These walls will actually be dripping like a light shower uh, year round, uh, end of August into September, just dripping moisture off of the rock walls. However, sounds fantastic. Let's go, sign me up. Uh, such amazing nature attracts humans. Additionally, having it so readily accessible um, attracts more humans that are able to get there with little to no effort. This may pose a problem because the area has been marketed extensively as accessible and diverse. Um, outdoor lovers uh, flock to the area. Um, those with more experience, as well as those, unfortunately, with less experience. The elevation and temperature and weather changes create wind. The walls described by Clark in his diary uh, remain today, and these walls make a wind tunnel effect, which is very popular with wind surfers and kite skiers and sailboaters. If anyone has ever watched the X Games on ESPN or any of the Red Bull challenges, you may have seen Hood River, Oregon featured in some of these things. Uh, I think the International Kite Surfing Championships um, have been held in the gorge uh, more than a few times. So that's one of the attracting features. Uh, this was from a flyer that was published in about 1970, kind of a pun on words here. Uh, the introduction of the major interstate on the Oregon side makes gorge access a breeze. 
So the old historic highway uh, was run down and neglected, partially built over uh, by the new interstate that runs uh, through the gorge uh, from Western Oregon into Eastern Oregon and Idaho and beyond. So this is a later summer picture. Uh, this was on the Oregon side, a hike up to Angel's Rest. So previously you saw my daughter standing back here. Uh, you may have noticed she was wearing flannels and a hat and had a laden backpack. Uh, with uh, flannel tights and boots on. She was standing back here where the trail is five feet wide versus these people here in shorts and flip-flops and no backpacks out on the edge where it is one foot wide and literally hundreds on this side or thousands on the other side feet down. Uh, this is a precipitous area and people like to come here and take selfies and uh, explore around. Um, however, the uh, volcanic basalt rocks are not always as secure as we might hope. A Minnesota woman fell to her death Friday while hiking in the Columbia River Gorge, suffered a fatal head injury when she fell 100 feet on the Multnomah Falls Larch Mountain Trail. This is a very popular, highly traveled, paved trail. Um, and so if we are getting in more remote areas, then things become even a little more scary. This is not an actual picture of this person, but I worked with this therapist who died in a gorge fall. Um, body was recovered at the creek, near the creek, at the bottom of a 265-foot ravine. August of last year, two hikers died days apart. The gorge claims on the Oregon side, I didn't have statistics for the Washington side, but approximately five lives per year. So it is not only beautiful and scenic and readily accessible, it is also very deadly and a bit dangerous and not to be taken lightly. This isn't going to the park and hiking around the picnic tables. This is actually a deadly dangerous area. 58% increase in rescue missions in the past decade reported by Multnomah County. Uh, visitors who do foolish things are nothing new. There's just more of them now, is what the head sheriff said. While we like to see sun protection and hats and hiking boots and backpacks laden with essentials, um, we too often see hikers that look like they're just going to the park, going to a tailgate. You cannot survive in the gorge wearing cotton tank tops and sandals. Additionally, in the past couple of decades, uh, gorge fires have become nearly commonplace. To greater or lesser extents, it feels like there is a human caused fire in the gorge annually at this point in time. Uh, bottom right here, we're threatening uh, one of the major fish hatcheries in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we actually uh, in Portland had uh, evacuation orders in place for this gorge fire from 2017. While lightning um, and natural caused fires have always existed, it seems like human fires and human traffic have magnified the destruction. Humans go off trail, humans go to the end of the peak to get a better selfie, humans uh, tread on the natural environment and underbrush and they bring their fireworks uh, to shoot off the top of the mountain. Um, and all of these things combine uh, with dramatic effects without the greenery and the underbrush and the protection of trees, then in the rain in the winter, we get massive landslides and the topography is changing. The gorge is changing. The gorge has probably always changed, but for me, it feels like the gorge is changing in a way that maybe is less than ideal. 
25 years ago, uh, author Blaine Hardin wrote a book called A River Lost. And basically, uh, in Clark's diary, he talks about uh, the Great Chute and these rocks that are eight to 10 feet high. Those have been buried, covered by the Columbia River uh, with the introduction of hydroelectric dams, um, which have improved uh, the navigation in the river and allowed the agriculture east of the Cascades to uh, flourish. And they can load up giant grain barges and within the course of just a couple of days, ship those to the ports west of the Cascades and overseas. However, uh, using the gorge as a major transport way um, certainly has changed uh, the way of life for many indigenous families and tribes that lived in the area, uh, changed their lives and how they function, and certainly the discussion about fish and fish habitats, and uh, that is always a roaring debate on both sides. Uh, this is from the Washington side, looking to the Oregon side uh, in 2018, 2019, after the big fires, and we still see the barren landscapes across the top of the gorge here. Uh, Mount Hood is just left off the screen up into the clouds. Here again is a picture of my daughter on a little day hike. Again, we have the hiking boots and the laden backpack and the head coverings and additional clothing and stuff. And I had spent a number of decades enjoying the gorge and all of the gorge, gorge's attractions and challenges. However, in the past decade and a half, it really, the crowds and the people and the push of people to get to the top of the mountain and see the next waterfall really has been kind of a turnoff for me. So uh, if you are willing to take on some elevation and head uphill from the gorge, um, you could be rewarded with um, sky high views and mountain vistas. And I have actually turned to doing more hiking up in the mountains in the Cascades and around Mount Hood. This little picture here uh, taken from Portland area, uh, we have elevations from 4,000 to Mount Hood. Uh, I think Mount Hood is the most, the most summited peak over 10,000 feet. I, well, maybe Pikes Peak, you can drive up to 12,000 feet on Pikes Peak, but um, uh, yeah, hundreds of people summit Mount Hood every year uh, from 5,000 feet up to the summit. Uh, I haven't done that since the 80s, um, but I have done more hiking up in the mountains as opposed to the gorge. Certainly way less people, arguably less accessible to get to the mountains. Uh, but this particular day on Lake Trillium, literally 12 people on the entire lake and camping around the lake as opposed to uh, thousands of people on a gorge trail. You still get great scenery up in the Cascade Mountains, uh, waterfalls, towering fir trees, and alpine challenges. So this was in the spring, this right-hand picture here, uh, glacial snow melt, really cold. Uh, we had to take down, uh, had to gather a couple of uh, poplar trees here and lay them across the creek to traverse across to the other side to continue our hike. So uh, still some challenges. Um, However, uh, I do want to tell a quick story here before we're out of time. Um, so uh, has anybody heard, anybody familiar with the hobby or the uh, entertainment called peak bagging? So we know some peak baggers. Uh, my daughter was in high school and one of her classmates was a peak bagger. Uh, the kid's father is actually a uh, world famous mountaineer, uh, won't give his name uh, because uh, information may be incriminating. Um, but my daughter went to high school with this young man and my son was in junior high with his sister. So uh, each family has a boy and a girl. 
And we decided uh, one weekend, the end of May, that it would be good to hike from the Columbia River all the way up to the top of Larch Mountain. Uh, this trail is just a hair over seven miles. And uh, the kid was like, I can count that in my peak bag list if I go from the Columbia River up to the peak of 5,100 feet up on top of Larch Mountain. So it's seven miles, it's hiking in the gorge, it's hiking past Multnomah Falls and some of these other famous places. Uh, this is the location where the Minnesota woman fell and died. Um, so right past there and then continuing on up. So uh, it was May, we called the forest service to make sure that the roads and trails were open. We called the sheriff to make sure that the roads and trails were open. Uh, we checked uh, with all the authorities to make sure everything was good to go and it was fine and it was the end of May. So we were going to do this hike on a Saturday afternoon. I wanted to start hiking at one o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, my friend, the famous mountaineer and the peak bagger himself, uh, was like, well, we have things to do in the morning. Why don't we meet and do lunch with the kids before we start off? And then uh, our wives can pack a lunch. They will drive to the top and meet us up on top. So my departing at one o'clock ended up being meeting for lunch at noon, meeting leaving their house at one, meeting starting hiking more like 2.30 or three. So we got a late start to the day, and when we showed up and started loading up, um, my son and my daughter and I all had ginormous laden backpacks, and the other family was looking at us like we had three heads. What are you guys doing? And we said, we're hiking in the gorge. You always got to be prepared in the gorge. And they're like, prepared for what? It's May. It's a beautiful, sunny day. Everything is great said, well, it is the gorge. You never know what can happen. So in my backpack, um, I had enough food and water for all of us to survive the night. I also had uh, a giant tarpaulin and I had uh, tied off some rope to my backpack. Uh, my daughter was packing extra clothes for everyone um, so that we could all have a change of clothes or extra layers um, and some additional water. And then my son as well was packing food and water. And he is about 12, 11 years old, I think. So the six of us set out uh, about three o'clock, uh, planning a seven mile hike, figuring two miles an hour is gonna take us three and a half hours. We'd get to the top around 6.30, uh, sunset about 8.30 with darkness really about nine. So they were like, we have an extra three hours before it gets dark, it's all fine. So we take off hiking and I had a great time. This was, uh, I wouldn't say pre-cell phone, but we didn't have cell service. So we were kind of off the grid, hiking up there, hiking up there. And it was all going well until we got about a mile from the top of Larch Mountain. And we ran into snow. Well, that hadn't been in the forecast. And that hadn't been reported by the Forest Service or the sheriff. And as we got to the top of Larch Mountain and things started clearing out a little bit, certainly the weather had moved in and it was in fact snowing. And we ran into some other hikers heading down the hill that said, uh, the parking lot is closed, the road is closed, there's no one up there. Well, then suddenly the wives cannot get to us in their vehicles. There will be no picnic dinner at the top of Larch Mountain. Uh, the kid will not be able to complete his peak bagger because it is now 6.30 and we have two hours of daylight to get back down. All right, well, you're thinking a three-hour hike up and a two-hour hike down should be pretty doable, but again, um, it's rugged terrain and we were already tired and so we started back down. Uh, the debate was, should we walk down the road? Well, I didn't know which gate was closed. So it's five miles to the first gate. And if that's closed, it's an additional three miles to the second gate. So that would be eight miles um, 
on the road, but we hadn't said that we would be on the road. We said we would be on the trail and uh, no services and no one to necessarily find us. So we opted to continue back down the trail the way we had come. So we turned around and started back down the trail, hurrying as much as we could. Um, we did pause to have food at one point in time as it was getting dark. We debated, do we want, to, we have enough supplies to stay overnight? Do we want to camp overnight? Um, risk having search and rescue come out and find us and show up in the morning, or do we want to continue on? And we voted to continue on, although then the concern was, well, it's dark. How do we continue on? Well, not a problem because my daughter and my son and I each had packed flashlights. In fact, my daughter had a flashlight and a headlamp. So between the six of us, we had four flashlights and we continued down in the dark and got back down to Multnomah Falls about 11 p.m., having hiked 14 miles that day. Um, but no one fell off the trail and we intentionally went slow to be safe and we were prepared. We had boots, we had extra layers of clothes. At one point, my son was getting a little blister. So we stopped, we changed his socks. Uh, we put moleskin in his shoe. Uh, we readjusted his trekking poles. We took some of the water out of his backpack and hydrated uh, the entire six of us so that he wouldn't have so much weight coming back down the hill. Um, so the other family uh, ag indeed agreed that uh, the gorge, you need to plan whenever you go somewhere, plan on worst case scenarios, plan on overnighting it, and then hope that you won't have to need it. Everybody survived, everybody was fine, the blister was fine, it was all good, but only because we had not planned on a day hike, we had planned on being stranded overnight, and then we didn't have to do that. But uh, that is kind of what happens in the gorge, even for those who are prepared. And if you think you're just gonna drive 30 miles and go for a little hike, um, that may not be entirely what you're in for. So Columbia River Gorge, highly recommended, amazing things to see. If you're into mosses and lichens and mushrooms, uh, you will see things there that occur nowhere else on the entire planet. Certainly uh, amazing scenery, amazing photo ops. However, uh, deadly and dangerous and not to be taken lightly. That is the Columbia Gorge. I'm going to actually stop screen sharing. It says questions, but I can take questions down. I see a couple things in the chat here. And so we will move on with that. <clears throat> there are a couple of questions in the chat. Ron, do you just want to look at them? Well, I might need my spectacles to do that. <laughs> okay. Well, I can uh, just start with one of them here. It's near, near the bottom. Yeah. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Questions, feel free. Yeah. Uh, bugs. There really are not bugs in the Pacific Northwest. Okay, there are, but they're tiny. I mean, they're small. Yeah. Uh, you can get mosquito bites wherever you go, but uh, I and okay, last summer here was very dry. I understand you had no mosquitoes because I didn't see any. Um, but apparently, uh, yeah, bugs, bugs are not a thing. Slugs are a thing. Slugs and beetles and things crawling on the ground are a thing, but not like not like flying bugs that are going to eat you alive. Uh, spiders, yeah, <laughs> watch out for spiders. But yeah, uh, let's see. Tidal rapids for kayaking. Um, the tide is uh, two and a half feet in Portland, um, does not extend as far as the gorge. And then there is the first dam. And of course, the tide does not go up past the dam. Um, kayaking, I would rather you would have more fun kayaking at the far western end of the Columbia River, not part of the gorge. Uh, but areas around Scappoose, Oregon, and uh, Kelso, Washington, and out to the coast would be much better for kayaking. Um, some coastal tide pools out by Astoria, way better. Once you get into the gorge, um, it's lots of river traffic, uh, lots of barges, lots of speedboats, and then lots of wind. So 
Um, I did do with a group of uh, with a group of scouts. I did do a canoe trip out to Sand Island where we camped overnight. That was fine, um, but again, there's uh, just there's a lot of river and gorge traffic, which is part of the uh, part of the turnoff for that. Is yeah, you can paddle out to an island, but you'll probably have a bunch of speed boaters out there with their with their beers and their loud music. So it's just not maybe the best thing. Um, let's see, early slide picture of a cable car. Yeah, so that was the aerial tram in Portland for Oregon Health Sciences University, not part of the gorge that was in Portland, but you can see the gorge from the aerial tram. Anybody else? Anything? Yeah, it wasn't the kids and I still talk about. Oh, that's a whole large mountain experience right there. Yeah. Um, so these people who actually uh, are are published outdoor enthusiasts uh, had spent a lot of time in the Yosemite area. Um, they have a very impressive peak bagger list, but uh, I dare say they were very unprepared for overnighting in the gorge. Um, and uh, so, yeah, when uh, when my daughter had to start breaking out the extra layers of clothes for the other people that didn't bring clothes, it was hard not to say I told you so. When it was dumping rain at 10 o'clock and we were thinking about camping and I'm like, remember when you said I shouldn't bring a tarp? Anybody want to use the tarp now? <laughs> but we opted to just continue on down. So it was fine. Ron, I see someone's asking about um, ticks. Um, I have never, I think, I think in 30 years in Portland, I think I had a dog that had a tick once, but yeah, it's not, it's not warm and it's not hot enough for ticks. Um, so yeah, we had that. No, don't have them again, black widow spiders, brown recluse. You definitely find those, but not ticks. Um, snakes, typically on the drier part, there aren't really any gorge snakes um, because it's, you know, 120 inches of rain, it's too wet for snakes. Um, on the east side, yeah, you certainly can see rattlesnakes. Um, I have um, up when I kind of shifted to hiking more in the Cascades uh, up in the mountains, um, I've seen like some garter snakes kind of thing, but they're all very catchable. There's no poisonous snake. I should I say no. I have never seen or heard of a poisonous snake on the west side of the Cascades. How about that? So yeah, if you want scenery and you want hikes, no ticks, no snakes. Um, yeah, Columbia River Gorge, highly recommended. Just beware that people die and people are kind of loud, so. Uh, yes, Mount Hood would totally be a good prep for Mount Rainier. Mount Hood, you can, the both times I have summited Mount Hood, I did it in one day. So uh, you get to Timberline Lodge at two o'clock in the morning, you catch a snow cat up Palmer Glacier, you start hiking at 4 a.m., you get up to the top about one or two in the afternoon, enjoy the views for a couple hours and then hike back down and you're down well before sunset. Mount Rainier is never less than two days. Uh, most people take three to summit Mount Rainier. Uh, Mount Hood is a good training hike at 11.2. Rainier at 14.4 is significantly more difficult. That extra 3,000 feet makes a giant difference in your breathing. 